How do we take a simple sound like a sine wave and turn it into this? Or turn a saw wave into this? Or use a recording of an air conditioner to make a guitar like this? The two most common techniques are additive and subtractive synthesis. Either we're adding frequencies or subtracting them to get our desired sound. We can often achieve the same result by using different techniques. For example, oscillator 1 was made by adding frequencies to a sine wave. Oscillator 2 was made by subtracting frequencies from a saw wave. We can think of subtractive synthesis like sculpting, but instead of chipping away at a slab of marble, we're removing frequencies with tools such as filters until we reach the final product. We can think of additive synthesis like painting, but instead of adding paint to a blank canvas, we're adding frequencies to something like a sine wave. So which technique do we use? Additive or subtractive synthesis? The answer is, it depends on the sound we're creating. It's important to know that there's no right or wrong way to design a sound, but there are definitely easier and more efficient ways. This is why it's important to know how the basic shapes sound, especially saw, square, and sine waves. These are the building blocks for the majority of the sounds I create on my channel. If you're struggling with differentiating between the basic shapes, I highly recommend checking out my ear training for sound designers video. There, I show you easy ways of practicing and testing your ears. You can have all the sound design and synthesis knowledge in the world, but it won't matter much if you aren't able to accurately describe what you're hearing. But don't worry if you're not getting it immediately. It takes time. After watching parts one and two of this tutorial series, we know what amplitude and frequency are. Now let's learn how we can change the amplitude of frequencies using a synthesizer. We'll start with some very common techniques of subtractive synthesis. The most common tool for removing or turning down the amplitude of frequencies is a filter. In Vital, we have access to two filters here and another on the effects page. In this window, we can see the effect the filter will have on our sound. The x-axis represents frequency and the y-axis represents amplitude. The orange part represents our sound the black area represents what has been filtered out. So by default, this filter is filtering out all the highest frequencies up here. We call this a low pass filter because it's allowing the low frequencies to pass through. In Vital, we can change the shape of our filter by changing the blend slider here. If I go all the way to the right, I'm filtering out low frequencies. So this would be called a high pass filter since high frequencies are passing through. If I move it to the middle, we call it a band pass filter because a specific band of frequencies is passing through while anything above or below it is filtered out. The cutoff controls the frequency where the filter starts and is controlled with this slider on the bottom. If we look over here, it says the type of filter we're using, analog 12 decibel. 12 decibels means that starting at the cutoff frequency, the amplitude of frequencies will be reduced 12 decibels per octave. So if we change this to a 24 decibel filter, the slope is steeper and the amplitude is reduced 24 decibels per octave past the cutoff. You may have noticed the bump here in the filter. This is called resonance and it's an increase in amplitude at the cutoff point. We control resonance with this vertical slider here. So strictly speaking, the filter effect isn't 100% subtractive. It can also add amplitude to certain frequencies. Most of these filters also cause a little bit of distortion to the sound. That can be controlled either with drive or simply by turning up the input gain of our oscillator. 
Don't worry too much about that for now. We'll talk in depth about distortion when we're discussing additive techniques. The last parameter we see here is the key tracking control. Right now, the cutoff of the filter stays the same regardless of what note I'm playing. So if, for example, I have a low pass filter, low notes will have more upper harmonics than high notes. And if I play really high, the note might get filtered out entirely. If I turn up key tracking to 100%, now the cutoff will move with the note that I play. That means every note I play will be harmonically the same. You may notice that the cutoff of our filter is measured in semitones by default. With that in mind, let's demonstrate what we've learned with an example. If I set the cutoff to 12 semitones and key tracking to 100%, then the amplitude of every note's harmonics will decrease starting one octave or 12 semitones above the note that I play. We can see that in the spectral analyzer. The second harmonic is one octave above the fundamental. After that second harmonic, the amplitude decreases 12 decibels per octave, and that will happen the same way for every note because key tracking is at 100%. So when do we use key tracking? Key tracking is useful if you're trying to shape the harmonic content of your sound. If you simply want to shape the overall frequency content of your sound, don't use key tracking, and the cutoff will stay in one place. In vital, if key tracking is at zero, then cutoff is measured in semitones above or below C4. So setting this cutoff to 12 means the cutoff is at the frequency of C5. If you're not using key tracking and you would rather see the unit in hertz, you can click on the advanced tab and change the frequency units from semitones to hertz. Most other synthesizers use the unit hertz for the cutoff, but using semitones is especially useful when using key tracking. Because if I'm shaping the harmonic content of my sound, I care more about where the cutoff is in relationship to the note that I'm playing. Now let's discuss different filter types. Here we have access to analog, dirty, ladder, digital, and diode filters. They're similar to the analog one that we've been using, but some of them have more or less distortion or different sounding distortion. The resonance also sounds different between them. I recommend experimenting with the different filter types to see what works best for your sound. In addition to those filters, we also have the formant, comb, and phaser filters, which are very differently shaped. A formant filter mimics the different vowel sounds of a human voice. One of the most famous examples is the bass from Pony by Genuine. A comb filter cuts out frequencies that aren't in the harmonic series of our cutoff frequency. This can be especially useful on a sample to create a string or flute-like sound. The phaser filter cuts out a number of frequencies depending on the blend position here. This can be useful for making metallic or bell-like sounds, especially when you turn the resonance all the way up. We can also combine filters. If I turn on filter 2, I can route an oscillator 1 just like filter 1. That means the filters are running in parallel and I have two sounds playing at once. One is the sound of oscillator 1 going through filter 1, and the other is the sound of oscillator 1 going through filter 2. If I want the filters to run in series, I can route the output of filter 1 to filter 2, or vice versa. If you have Vital version 1.5 or later, you have access to these spectral filters here. These let us draw the shape of our filter by clicking the pencil icon here. The cutoff is controlled by the knob. That cutoff is represented by the middle point of the x-axis. The phase slider controls how much of the frequency spectrum the filter applies to, 
with left being a broader range and right being a narrower range. So if my shape is a triangle, this will sound like a bandpass filter. This will behave like a low-pass filter. And this will behave like a high-pass filter. We can also get weird with it. This filter tool is especially useful if we want control over the amplitude of our oscillator's harmonics. You can think of it like a filter with 100% key tracking, but instead of being limited to low pass, band pass, high pass, or 12 and 24 decibel filters, you can use whatever shape you want. Now let's talk about another technique that can be subtractive or additive depending on how it's used. This technique is called pulse width modulation sometimes abbreviated PWM, and it's traditionally used on a square wave, and it sounds like this. So what is this doing? You can see what it's doing to the waveform here, but what is it doing to the harmonics of our sound? Well, remember how a square wave only has odd-ordered harmonics? Another way of looking at that pattern is that every second harmonic is missing. Let's take a look at a quarter pulse. This is the next keyframe in the basic shapes. Now you'll notice that every fourth harmonic is missing. Can you guess then what an eighth pulse will look like in the spectrum analyzer? If you guess that every eighth harmonic would be missing, you are correct. We apply the same concept to remove every third harmonic by setting pulse width to 33.33%. At 20%, every fifth harmonic is removed, and so on. We can also go in between these perfect ratios to get a more complex pattern of harmonics. In Vital, we can apply pulse width modulation to other waveforms as well, and even change the phase of the waveform before the pulse width modulation to get some unique sounds. We can also get a subtractive effect by using two of the same oscillators and offsetting their phase. This will result in the phase cancellation of certain frequencies starting at the top. Watch and listen as I offset the phase of two saw waves. Now let's move over to the effects section and talk about our subtractive tools here. Here we have another filter. This filter will be applied to the sound as a whole, rather than each note individually. The filters on the voice page are polyphonic, which means that every note I play gets its own filter. That's good news, because if I'm using key tracking, that means the cutoff would be different for every note I play. And if I'm playing more than one note at once, each note would need a filter with a different cutoff. That's not the case for the filter in the effects section because it's applied to all the sound being sent to the effects, which by default is any sound on the voice page. If I want an oscillator to bypass the effects, I can set it to direct out. If I send the oscillator to the filters, it will then automatically get sent to the effects. Another subtractive effect on the effects page is the equalizer. The equalizer is similar to the filter, but it's cleaner, meaning it doesn't have nearly as much distortion and it's more flexible. I can add a high pass and a low pass. I can add a notch filter, which cuts out a specific frequency. And I can turn that notch into a band pass by turning up the gain. I can also change the cutoff and resonance the same way I did with the filters. If I click these, I can turn the high and low passes into high and low shelves, which are less drastic. Now we have several effects that can be used to subtract amplitude from various frequencies to whittle away the unnecessary parts of our sound. Most synthesizers from the 70s and early 80s relied entirely on basic shapes and filters to create sounds. Then in 1983, Yamaha released the DX7 synthesizer, 
which exclusively use sine waves and an additive technique called frequency modulation to generate many unique sounds. In the next video, we're going to talk about additive synthesis and how you can make a sound like this just by using sine waves.